strengthened and open biological family, parents and their children welcoming members of their spiritual family into their home, coming together to celebrate kingdom lifestyle in the context of an intergenerational home group. As we've just seen, the fruit of strengthened, open families engaging with the spiritual family, I wanted to take a few minutes to consider God's perspective of the biological family. We begin by realizing that God said he created man and woman in his image. In fact, we are told that the very first name that God uses to describe himself with Elohim has in it, in the Hebrew letters, the letter for man and woman. In effect, God has chosen to reveal himself through a man and a woman, through a father and mother, to that child that is born. And to a child, the face of their parents is the face of God. And it is the root system where God is intended for us from a very, very young age, even in the womb, to be welcomed and loved, to discover who God is, who we are, what life is all about, how to engage in meaningful relationships. All of these very formative core things are what happens or is to happen inside a biological family. But too often, as we've already mentioned, families can become self-serving especially in a consumer-driven time where people are considering what they can get out of life as opposed to what they can give. And children learn that pretty quickly too. And so it's so important from a young age that families begin to engage with God's purpose for their family. And one of the clearest examples of this that I know in the Bible is what God spoke to Abraham and his family. We know the promise in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, where God says, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, and through you I'm going to bless all the nations. This was sort of the launching pad of God's plan to really reveal himself, his will, and his blessing throughout the nations. But then in chapter 18, we read in verses 17 and 18 how Jesus comes down together with two angels to visit Abraham. And he says... Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Speaking of the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah that he was contemplating. Since Abraham will surely become a great nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Then these words, for I have chosen him. And I would have expected him to say, I've chosen him to build cities, to organize training programs for many leaders, you know, to uh, be involved in different kinds of efforts that would really affect nations. But what he says next that he chose him for really speaks to us about God's purpose for the biological family. There he says, I've chosen him so that he would command or direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right. And then these very pivotal words, so that so that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. The condition for God's covenant promise of blessing Abraham and in turn being a blessing through him to all the nations was whether or not Abraham would take leadership in his marriage, in his home, and what happened at his kitchen table would determine whether or not there would be a flow of God's blessing throughout the nations. Now that reality struck me as a young father right between the eyes because that wasn't my understanding of the key to being a blessing. I was trying to figure out how to look after my wife and my children so that I could get on with serving God. And one day God asked me, Dale, why don't you want me to bless you? Why are you living the way you are? And I, I said, but Lord, I am praying that you would bless me and use me. And then he took me back to this and said, Dale, the covenant still stands and the condition is still the same. You must make a priority 
in your marriage, with your family, if you are going to experience the kind of blessing, not only that you can receive as a family, but how you can be a blessing as a family. A family blessed to bless. It's God's plan for the biological family. And so we see that happening again and again, where God wants to do something of great significance. He doesn't just call a single person. He involves families, Adam and Eve, to multiply, fill the whole earth and subdue it to bring God's will on the earth. Noah and his sons and their wives building the ark and saving the animal world and the human race. We see Abraham, as I mentioned, and we come to the New Testament and we even find single parent families, Mary and her kids, who are the, the cornerstone of the New Testament church. And so these biblically based facts help us to understand that our goal in engaging with families is not only that we would strengthen the marriage relationship, which is very important, and strengthen the relationship between the parents and their children, which is very important. But at their heart, they would understand that the family doesn't exist just for itself. The family has been created for God. And the family can become a place where we receive the blessing of knowing God and loving one another and all that goes with that, but that we can also be a blessing first to the heart of God and then to others. Now, developing that kind of capacity to open your home to others as we saw tonight, that takes preparation. And in some of our other uh, King's Kids International training programs, we focus on this. How to develop teamwork in the family. How to really help our children and our young people to develop in their faith to partner with their parents, to become comfortable in how they do reach out to others, how they pray with people, how they serve people. These things can become a real way of life for a family. And they can be strengthened to the point where they enjoy having people over. It's not just the parents' guests, it's the guests of the kids too. I heard tonight the boy is excited about so-and-so coming over. It wasn't some boring adult prayer meeting or Bible study where they had to go in the bedroom and be quiet while the adults did something. This was something that as a family they prepared for and they welcomed people to join them. Well, I believe this is so much of a joy and so important for the biological family to be developed in this way inside our church family and inside our Christian communities that we really do strengthen our biological families so they can be open, so they can connect with the spiritual family, and so they can move out with the spiritual family in some exciting ways. Now speaking of the spiritual family, and there's of course much more we can say about the biological family, but I just wanted to leave those thoughts with you as an intro to what I hope will be further things that we can focus on together about the family in some other settings of training. But on the spiritual family again, one of the areas that I'd like us to recognize is the importance of spiritual fathers and mothers. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15, even though you have 10,000 guardians, you have very few fathers. Now what is a spiritual father, a spiritual mother? And, and what is their role? Well, my understanding is a, a spiritual father, Paul was one to Timothy, and we see that being modeled in different settings, is somebody that that God grants grace to, to really take a younger person into their heart, disciple them, walk with them in a meaningful way. And I'd like to just for a few moments reflect on what some of those qualities are. In my own life, I think this is probably one of the most meaningful aspects of what is happening today for me. I have four wonderful children, their wives and grandchildren, and they're a great delight to me. But I also have spiritual sons and daughters. And when I relate to them, I've learned some things. Number one, that grace first, truth second. 
I ask the Lord to point out those young persons that I am to take into my heart. You can't do it with everybody. And so it really needs to be a God thing where that's prompted in your heart. And when I do, then I don't check them out to see how I can fix them or help them first. First of all, grace first. I set aside the things that I think should change. I set aside the things I think I can teach them. That's secondary. And first of all, I ask the Lord to show me who they are in His sight, to really honor and treasure them for who they are, and to take them into my heart and love them with the love that flows from the heart of God. And you know what? They can sense that. A young person can sense very, very quickly if somebody is there to fix them or make them better. You know, and they have teachers. They have even coaches and mentors in different career paths, etc. But a spiritual father, that's something different. A spiritual mother, something different. It's somebody who loves you and believes in you and is excited about your potential. Secondly, we see how Paul, in addition to taking Timothy into his heart and loving him, prays for him. And that really is such an obvious key, but it's there as you begin to pray for this precious spiritual son or daughter that God begins to show you not only what to pray for, but some more about what his purposes are in that person's life. You begin to see their potential opening up to you, and this leads you to the third aspect, which is to encourage them, to see what is there through the eyes of the Spirit, to speak into those areas, to encourage them and build them up, to call forth the giftings that are there, and in some cases, as God prompts you, to lay hands on them and to impart spiritual gifts to them, all coming out of the prayer process that gives you God's heart and thoughts towards that person. And then as we begin to move closer and closer together, we long to create an atmosphere of transparency and heart sharing. And the way this opens up is that you begin as a spiritual father in humility to be open about your own struggles. You notice how Paul speaks quite openly about how tired he was, about the different di difficulties he was facing. He was very transparent. And you know, it's interesting that it's not our strengths that bring us closer to each other. It's actually our points of struggle and, and vulnerability that endear us to each other. It says, I as a spiritual father trust you with the secrets here that I'm not particularly proud of, but I'd like you to know what's really happening in my life. Well, this engenders a response to say, if this father is opening his heart to me like this and being honest with me in this way, well, maybe I can take the risk of trusting him with my heart and the things I'm struggling with. You know, often a younger person is wondering, is this older person seeing me as an object of their ministry, you know? Or do they really, really care about me? And when you begin to build that trust bridge of transparency and openness together, it begins to bring forth uh, an opportunity to move into accountability. And this is where we ask that son or daughter, would you like me to hold you accountable in some ways and help you to grow? And then they begin to share, if they choose to, some of their temptations and struggles, asking you to stand with them so that when you meet, you can ask them how they're doing and, and support them as they begin to change their habits and strengthen their character. But that's by permission. We ask them, and they, in response, give us the opportunity to connect there. And then finally, as we have walked together, taken them in our hearts in love, prayed for them, seen them through God's eyes, encouraged them, shared transparently with each other and moving into accountable relationships. Now, as they share different things with us, we ask them, would you like to also have some instruction or input from me? Now, often with sons and daughters, they would rather hear some stories. Why is that? Because really what they're looking for is more the how than the what. They often know a lot of biblical truth if you know we're walking with Christian young people. But they want to know, how do you really do this? 
And so as a spiritual father and mother, to just tell some of the stories when they talk about their challenges, to say, you know, that reminds me. And to share how you face that and walk that through. And they laugh and they smile, they enjoy the story. But they feel so encouraged and strengthened because they say, you know what? If God has met you in these ways, good chance he can help me too. And in the end, it's got to be enjoyable, is that right? They need to look forward to it, to say, you know what? Dad, I'd love to have another time with you. When could we get together again? And that's the acid test, isn't it? That we really have become a spiritual father that is there. And may I repeat these things again? That as a spiritual father, we take our sons and daughters in our heart. We pray for them faithfully. We encourage them and impart to them blessing, strengthening. We walk transparently with them and, and hear their hearts. And we hold them accountable to the degree they ask us to in the issues that they're struggling in. And we give instruction and input at times and ways that they ask for it. It may be they're just wanting us to hear. But as they ask for it, we bring it. And we emphasize the stories of our lives. And we look for ways to enjoy being together. I've taken time to talk about spiritual fathers and mothers because in the spiritual family, being strengthened in order to connect with the biological families and, and live the kingdom lifestyle. A part of linking the generations is really that the spiritual fathers and mothers take their place and help that spiritual family come to maturity. So this is our, our dream because it's our father's dream. That the biological families would be strengthened to the point they could open up and connect with the spiritual family. And the spiritual family could in turn be strengthened and, and connect with the biological family. And together they could encounter God and grow up together into Jesus and have the strength to live a kingdom lifestyle that impacts their community and the world. celebration here for me to join you tonight not only in the good food thank you <laughs> but also in the wonderful fellowship that is happening here I wish more people could enjoy this kind of kingdom lifestyle because what we're seeing here is God's longing being fulfilled which is that the biological families would be able to come together with the spiritual family and together to grow in their intimacy with God. I think you know that in the New Testament, some of the things that Jesus spoke out about family caused confusion then and maybe even now. He didn't intend it that way, but I'd like us to look at some of his words so that we have his perspective of the biological family and the spiritual family. Also with Paul, he said some interesting things about marriage and family that some have taken the wrong way. And first of all, in Luke chapter 4, verse 26, Jesus says, Unless you hate your father and mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. To hate your father and mother, your wife, your, you, know, you understand. What was that talking about? But the same Jesus, as you know, a short time later, on the cross, suffering as he was, the one person that he identified and showed his concern to beyond everyone else was his mother. Mm -hmm. And he made sure that John looked after her, even from the cross. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at these two things, which seem like extremes, mm -hmm. on one side, Jesus also saying, who is my brother, my sister, my father, my mother? those who do the will of God. Why was he seemingly so hard on the biological family when really we see he loved his mother? He stayed home and helped his family for 18 years after he knew he was the Messiah. What is that about? I believe what he was wanting to do was to deal with the wrong priority that the biological family had in that Asian culture where family was not just a place to relate and, and share life. 
family was in charge, you know. What the family decided was the final word, and he was saying no. Biological family is important, but unless I'm the Lord of your heart and your family, you will miss my blessing. So he was really talking, wasn't he, about his lordship. So there must be a way that Jesus can be Lord and our family as a biological family can really be blessed and a blessing. Is that right? But he was also speaking about spiritual family as being very important. And I'd like us in a few moments to consider what is the role of the biological family and the spiritual family. And now some of the words of Paul. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, It's better for a man not to marry. Oh, what? Was he against marriage and family? Well, he says there, concerning the things that I've, you have written to me about. He was talking about problems in that church where there was immorality and other issues. But some people have taken that to mean, you know, if you get married, it's second best. If you really want to serve God, you should stay single. Well, the answer to that is, if God's will is for you to be single, you should be single. But if his will is to get married and you're getting married for God's glory, of course, it's a good thing. Because Paul also says, these are the qualifications for an elder. In Philippians, he says, the elder must be the husband of one wife. He must manage his household in the right way. How can you lead the family of God if you can't take care of your own family, you know? He, Paul is the one who wrote Ephesians chapter 5, which speaks about husbands laying down their lives for their wives and wives, you know? So we see that in both situations... Jesus and Paul are wrestling with the issue of understanding the importance of the biological family, but also the importance of the spiritual family and how we are to live in a way where these two are strengthened so that they can come together in order to be able to live a kingdom lifestyle. But you know and I know so often there's a tension between these. Should I stay home with my family tonight or should I go to the prayer meeting, you know? <laughs> should I go on the mission trip or should I be with my wife? You know, there's a tension going on there. So it's so important that we really understand God's perspective on kingdom lifestyle. And we see this in Acts chapter 2 where it's describing the early church. And it says that they met from house to house, if you remember, but also in the temple daily. So there was both what was in the house and what was in the temple. So both of them were happening. But somehow these guys figured out how to love one another in such a, a real and genuine way that what was happening in the home, what was coming from the temple, really connected. And people saw the kind of koinonia or love they had for each other, the way they shared life. And they said, wow, that's the way I want to live. <laughs> you know? And that's what we want, isn't it? that people come to church and they say, well, I, you know, maybe I like this church, don't like this church. That's just one part, you know, of the kingdom. And not many people can say, would you like to see the kingdom of God come on home? Because, again, we're, we're needing to understand how to strengthen our biological families. Okay? So what I'm not going to do tonight is talk about how to do that in detail because I'd like you to be able to have some dessert and, you know, continue on with what's here. And I know that the boys need to go to bed. It's a school night. And uh, it's great, you guys, to have you with us because that's what's making this come together so meaningful. But I want us to think for a moment about how these can come together. How can we bring the biological family and the spiritual family together? Just a few simple thoughts. First of all, as we look at the Ha family, the reason that the boys are at the door welcoming you is not just because they're friendly boys, but as a family, they have prepared themselves. They've honored their children. They've welcomed them to join them in their personal family devotions. They're developing a strength of relationships as a couple. Now, no family is perfect. Even God the Father has a lot of messed up children. Is that right? Okay, <laughs> so there's, we're not saying that they're perfect, but we are saying they've invested into their relationships and they've developed in a way where their vision is not just to be a happy family living for themselves, 
but they've been learning how to receive God's blessings so that they can share the blessing. They have a perspective of being an open family, a family that needs spiritual family members to connect with them because they understand even for the boys that they need older brothers and sisters and they need the strength of the spiritual family to really help them to be all they long to be as a family. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And so inviting you here is not just to fix your problems and look after you. They get blessed too, you know, <laughs> through having you here and they know that. But that means that the family has to be strengthened enough and opened enough to be able to connect with the spiritual family. Is that right? Now we think about the spiritual family. Not every single adult would like to go and spend the evening with a family that has kids. Okay? Now I know that might sound terrible, but so often when you're working so hard and you're tired, you love kids, but oh, not tonight, you know? I want to be with my own kind. I want to relax. I want to be in a social atmosphere, you know? that's a little more familiar to me. Now, what's the problem there? The problem is that those people probably come from a very painful family background. They probably haven't experienced a happy, you know, warm, loving family atmosphere. So when you say, we're gonna go visit a family, they're saying, well, thank you, but no thank you. you know? <laughs> because it has a negative connotation to them. And also, they probably have almost rejected the family factor for them. Many are new believers. They haven't grown up in a Christian family, you know. And they're saying, I'm happy with the spiritual family. I don't need the biological family, you know. This is enough for me. The problem with that thinking is it's not biblical. Okay? Because God has designed that we would come through a biological family. That's why he said, one of his Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long, you'll be healthy, and that it might go well with you, that you might prosper. God's saying, unless God heals your heart in relationship to your biological family, even if they're Buddhist, even if you know all these difficult things are there, it's still God's will to strengthen our relationships back into our families that is still our root system. And it's a part of his blessing to us. Mm -hmm. But how do we reach back into our families when we've never experienced, you know, mm -hmm. a, a healthy Christian family? Well, that's a reason to be with Christian families. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That they can be a part of healing our hearts and giving us hope and enabling us to reach back into our families. Mm -hmm. Then there are young people who hope to get married and have their own families. Mm -hmm. Some of them are sitting around the table right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do they get ready? for marriage. How do they get ready to have their own children? They've never experienced Christian family before. They have it as a wonderful romantic idea. But God wants the spiritual family to come together with the biological family so the spiritual family can learn. So get ready. God has amazing things planned for us as we learn to live His kingdom. In radical obedience to Him, He will take us with Him and make us a blessing to many, many people.